Welcome to the Tuesday Night's Freedom for Targeted Individuals.org podcast. I'm your moderator, Ella. You can join us live, which I encourage people to do, every Tuesday and Thursday beginning at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time by calling 515-606-5187, and that is the new number that was assigned to me, and entering the ID, which is still the same, 4000 pound this is a solution, educational, and activism-based podcast, but the views and opinions of my guests and participants are not necessarily my own personal views and opinions. My goal is that everyone can obtain something out of tonight, especially a feeling of empowerment. If you are new to the call, please stay on, and we will get you some support, some helpful links, some websites, and connect you with others. You can also visit our website, freedomfortargetedindividuals.org, and email me directly at fftiorg at gmail.com. And tonight we have a very compelling um, a person that we all adore in this community. We have actor Stephen Shellen with us. And we also have Miss Midge Mathis, who, with her group of Targeted Justice, went to Washington, D.C. And I'm going to let her give a quick announcement about that, which she did, I think, was really wonderful work. And I'm very proud of them for doing this and taking this initiative. So, Midge, you're first. Go ahead. Thanks, Ella. Yeah, so. Um, the Target Justice team just got back from Washington, D.C. It's something that we had been planning to do for a long time. And we spent three whole days pounding the pavement, going to over 100 congressmen and senators. We did have some appointments and talked to some civil rights directors, as well as other personnel in the offices of the um, legislators. It was very compelling. I mean, it was. I loved it. It um, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Everybody was very receptive, except for one. I won't say who that was, um, but everybody else. They were so kind and so open, and um, we had folders uh, filled with information and some of my pictures. I met with several of uh, my Arizona legislators, and. Um, their staff is just very helpful setting up the appointments because you do need to have an appointment if you can. <laughs> Excuse me, Ella. Um, anyhow, so, you know, we started asking, you know, have you ever heard of targeted individuals? And some of them had. And they knew about the diplomats. And um, one person in particular was living um, uh, in the same building where some of the diplomats were hurt in China. And so he was well aware of what was happening. And, uh, I mean, the look on his face said everything when he – because I think there's a little bit more to the story than what they're telling. So, um, you guys, it was just great, and we plan on going back. And I don't want to take up too much time because I really want to hear my friend Stephen. Sure. So uh, maybe I can come back on another time, Ella, and talk a little bit more about it. But, you guys, it was wonderful. I think to date it was the most – productive and most important work that I've done yet, or I should say targeted justice. And afterwards, um, our membership shot up. We have now over 2,000 members um, for the class action lawsuit. I'm anxious to hear what happened. Yeah, well, I can talk another night. I want to hear my friend. Oh. You know, it's good, good to hear your voice, Stephen. Oh, thank I want you. To tell you. Really and truly. So, um, But it was great. I mean, it was just very enlightening and exciting and um i just can't talk about it enough it was just wonderful uh, it was not what i had expected actually i thought they would slam the doors on us but they did not at all wow so, yeah so you know the deal is is that you know a lot of them know they know what's going on and so, you know, I, clear, I seriously believe that it's just a matter of time and this stuff is going to break wide open. But we went from morning to night. We have, um, I have a TI friend that lives in the area who used to work in Washington, D.C. He kind of stays behind the scenes, and he was our driver. He knew exactly where to go. We couldn't have done it without him. And um, it was just so productive and wonderful. Um, so we had Jean Eisenhower, uh, who lives here in Arizona. Um, she is now part of the Targeted Justice team, Susan Olson, Richard Lighthouse, and myself. And then um, another person traveled up from Pennsylvania, and no, no one has ever heard of him before. He's a doctor slash attorney, and he joined us. 
And eventually, I hope Ella can interview this person. His story is fascinating. So anyhow, I don't want to take up any more time, but um, you guys just hang in there because I think great things are happening. Wow. What a difference yeah. in that hearing that they had all those years ago for the Obama administration. Yeah. That's Yeah, and you know, this is what they need to hear and see, and uh, I, I, I just can't get over how everybody was so welcome. I mean, they were just wonderful to us. And like I said, we did have some um, appointments, and we got to take pictures with the legislators, and uh, it was just amazing, absolutely amazing. Wow. Yeah. So anyhow, I don't want to take up any more time. Um, I want to hear what Stephen has to say. Oh, sure. Okay, well, I'm inter- I don't know. I think your stuff is much more interesting in a way. Oh, I don't know. I can talk about it another time, Stephen. All seriously. Right. Okay. Well, Stephen, I'm so glad to have you back again. I've interviewed you two other times now, and I'm so excited to have you back on. Do you know you were the first person who agreed to an interview on my very first call? We had 10 people on it. I do remember that. Yes, I do. <laughs> we had 10 people on the call, and I think maybe nine at the end was eight or nine. I don't remember, but you chatted with me for hours, and, yeah, you helped give me some wings. Okay. Yeah, well, you were just getting all the stuff down. You were just uh, learning learning your way at that point, right? No. How it is and all that stuff. And, nope. yeah, I, I do ago. remember that. Yeah, thank you. Come thank you for being way. there. I've seen a lot of progress in different interview. ways in the last, I don't know, I really think the last five to ten years especially. That last five to ten years what? I didn't hear what you said about five I just, to ten I years. Just, I've seen a lot of progress the last oh, five to exactly. ten years. I mean, Compared to what it was 20 years ago, which went 20 years ago, there wasn't even a name for for what I was going through. I didn't even know there was another single human being on the planet going through what I was going through. So um, it's changed an awful lot since then. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't, I can't yes, imagine nice what that was I heard like. that too, because as you know, I've only been around a few years. But you know, people say it's just been, it's just been gaining momentum, and there's more. It's actually an actual movement now, and um, so that's exciting. It is. I'm going to tell everybody. Uh, I'm going to give them some of the background on you. Um, okay. Some people may not know who you are because we have so many people coming. Um, into the community at this point because this is really getting out there. People are understanding. Um, they're finding out what's going on with themselves, and it just seems to be growing exponentially, the crime, as well as the people coming uh, forward looking for support. For support. So Stephen Shallon um, is a Canadian actor and voice actor. He is probably best known for his role as Luke Brenner on the TV series, series Counter-Strike, for his roles as Neil in Robert Redford's A River Runs Through It, and for his voice acting in the video game Deuce X Human Revolution. Plus, I know I saw you in another movie. Gosh, it was in like 2011. I don't see it on here. Hold on. You've done a lot of work. Was it the one with Angelina Jolie? Was that the one you were on? That was, I was actually homeless. I'd lost everything at that point. My targeting started in October 1995. It had to do with my ex-wife, who, who I still am not divorced from, by the way. I can't find her. So I can't even get my, um, I can't even get my retirement, my early retirement from Screen Actors Guild. <clears throat> so um, I'm just making my art and washing dishes and doing what I have to do to get by and renting out my film. But I, I was targeted in 1995 in October, and um, that movie, Gone in, uh, Gone in 60 Seconds, is the one you're referring to. I'd already been blacklisted, and I was lucky enough because I knew the director, so he gave me a day in Gone in 60 Seconds. But the previous film I'd done, um, on the last take, of this shot, and it was a, t- if you're, anyone's ever worked on a film set, you know it's all about matching your lighting and your camera angles. Well, they decided to do this one last shot of a scene we'd already shot to death, and the sun was going down, so I'm looking at the sky thinking, 
this is never going to match anything we've already shot in the bright Nevada sun. We were shooting outside of Las Vegas. But they said, oh, no, we need to do this one last shot. So I said, but we've shot this. Okay, okay. And I'm always trying, because I'm already, I'm so used to being considered crazy and being mistreated that, you know, you acquiesce and you try to please people, which is a terrible mistake in retrospect, I now realize. But I was still trying to act normal while I'm getting death threats and 24-7 harassment. I'm still trying to act normal. So I agreed to do this last shot, and on this last shot, of course, the six foot six ex NFL football player, who was the stuntman actor in this, and I'd seen his ring on the way to the set in the van, and I asked him, "Which hand are you going to hit me with?" And he said, "His right hand." And I said, "Oh, you're going to wear that? You got a double for that ring? I'm, I'm hoping." He had this huge ring, and he had hands. You can only imagine the size of his hands, twice the size of mine at least. And no, he didn't need a double for the ring because he knew what I was doing, and it was this huge rock about two two inches by two inches and then maybe an inch high. It was huge anyway. So, of course, we shoot the last scene. It's the last scene of the day, and the sun's going down, so it won't match anything. Well, he, I see him because I've done stunts for 20 years up to that point, and I see his right leg. Let me think. I guess it would be his left leg move, for, move forward. Well, in a stunt, when you're punching someone, you, you plant your foot, and as hard as you punch, you're never going to go that extra, say, 10 inches and hit anyone. It's a, it's, a, it's a way you set up a stunt. As long as you don't move your foot, as long as you don't plant yourself into it or move forward into the punch, you're never going to hit the person. That's how they do the stunts that you see in the movies, and the actor getting hit sells it by throwing his head back. And, you know, it looks like he got hit, but there's still probably t- at least 10 inches clearance. Well, I see the guy's foot moving, so I start reeling backwards. I reel back. I go back about three feet at least. So I'm leaning, leaning, leaning back to avoid this punch that's coming. He still manages to hit me, and the blood goes into the camera lens. Mm -hmm. And I lie on the ground. Now, I was just nicked. I got a kind of an ugly scar from it, but I wasn't wasn't hit directly like he had hoped. Anyway... Make a long story short, no one apologized to me. I didn't get any severance pay or anything from Screen Actors Guild. And I honestly think in retrospect, for a number of different reasons, which I won't bore you with, but that guy was intentionally trying to um, put my nose somewhere up inside of my brain cavity. So, you know, I did Gone in 60 Seconds after that film. Same producer, Scott Rosenberg. This guy that punched me was hanging out with Scott Rosenberg in his trailer. So I guess Scott Rosenberg, I'm assuming, wanted this guy to punch me in the head. So um, after when I did Gone in 60 Seconds, I honestly was expecting a light to fall on me. I mean, I was expecting any kind of disaster. So the fact that I got through with Nick uh, Cage ad-libbing, they all thought that was great. I thought it was just great that I didn't have anything fall on me or I didn't get hit but that was my life back then and I was living in a in this guy's backyard in Phoenix Arizona I was sleeping in his backyard and I was waking up every day and setting tiles with him him and his Mexican crew and then I got the call to do gone in 60 seconds I came back to LA and did it and then um, I was living in, a, when I was in L.A., I was living in someone's broken down car. It was just unbelievable what my life was then and how alone I was. And the only reason I sort of expounded on this or dragged this out is just to sort of, just to let T.I.s out there or anyone that thinks they're being gang stalked or targeted with weapons or whatever, just how much the climate has changed compared to what it was then when I was so alone, and it wasn't even until like 2002 that I found, I finally um, was living in northern Quebec, 
and I had a girlfriend, and she was a graphic artist, so I would go to her office at night while she would work, because she liked to work, at the, you know, when it was quiet at night, and I'd go to the office with her, and I started going on the, her computers there, and they had internet, and then I found a, a, um, a site called Mind Control Forms, and I remember sitting at the computer, reading basically different versions of my story from different, this is before we even had the name Targeted Individual. Um, this was called Mind Control Forms. I don't even remember what they referred to, what I was going through back then. But I remember sitting there at the computer and reading basically my story and realizing for the first time in seven years, oh my gosh, I'm not the only person going through these you know, being followed in traffic, be having break-ins, getting death threats, having furniture moved around, having clothes altered, having people tell me to forget about my kids or I'm dead. I wasn't the only person in the world going through this, that there were others on the planet going through, you know, very similar uh, harassment techniques that I was, you know, surviving through. So, yeah, that was um, that was very... Very enlightening, very encouraging. Um, I kept really um, meticulous notes back then. So, and I tell this to anyone: um, if you think you're being targeted, make really good notes for yourself. As soon as it happens, um, make notes because I do know that if you wait a day or two days to write down exactly what happened, our minds and our memories. Um, they have a tendency to shift and not exactly remember accurately what exactly happened. But if you write down events that are happening to you almost as soon as they happen, then your mind and your memory has no chance to um, tweak it, change it, alter it, or anything. You know, what you've written down is exactly what you've just experienced. And that was really uh, beneficial for me because I could go back and read these things, and I still can. And I can go back and, you know, it's, it's, it's also sometimes hard reliving it, but I can go back and reference what I wrote down and beyond a shadow of a doubt. Because even now, if I remember some of the stuff I went through, I'm like, did I really have that car drive up the sidewalk trying to take me out? And people came out and said, that car is tr intentionally trying to hit you. Did that, did that really happen like that? Well, because I made these notes, you know, my mind, my memory hasn't had a chance to, it didn't have a chance to shift. So I can go back and refresh my memory. Oh, yes, no, this did happen like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, and it's good advice. Absolutely. Yeah, because we all do have a tendency to change things. And I don't mean embellish things. I just mean change things and part of us doesn't want to believe it's as satanic and evil and horrendous as it is um, because it just goes against all human nature how could you know unless you're a criminal you've done some terrible thing and even if that's the case then you know you deserve a trial and a, and a fair trial but if you're being harassed and, and you're you're a person that hasn't hasn't done anything that warrants it. It's so hard for you to get your mind around um, the notion that some, you know, some 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 agency or or you know, uh, black cube or some firm is hired, let's say, to basically harass you and drive you to suicide, or at the very least make you appear um, mentally ill if you do tell someone. Well, the average person can't comprehend that there could be any people that evil that would do that to someone. Right, I agree. Mm -hmm. So that was that. And then, um, yeah, um, I'd, and as I've sat back and participated, <clears throat> and watched um, the TI community grow, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing. It's really, I think after 23 years for me personally, it's taken such a toll. Um, when I came out and did some radio interviews in 2010, 
with a girl called Sonia from the Truth of Girls, um, there wasn't that much in terms of people. They, people were starting to come out, and now we had the name targeted individual. And I came out, and I was doing not so bad. I'd sort of crawled out from underneath of the blacklist. I was still blacklisted for acting in films, but I was allowed to do voiceover work. And I, and I created, I recreated myself as a visual artist, and I had some really successful art shows, some of them even museum-sponsored art shows. So I was doing pretty well. But after I did that initial interview on the radio with Sonia from the Truth of Girls, um, work pretty much dried up, and then um, and then I I wasn't even my my voice agent was she told me she could not submit me, and when I asked her why, she said. She was afraid of what I'd say to a client, and I said, well, have I ever, have you ever had a complaint? Have I ever said something to a client? Like, uh, let's say when I'm doing a Honda commercial, have I said something to the ad agency people or anything? And I, and I knew I hadn't because I, I, I made it a policy not to talk about what had happened to me when I was in a, you know, a work environment. I mean, I might have made art shows about some of the stuff that had transpired, but that's my right as an artist. I can make art about anything I want. But I knew better than to go and do a voiceover for McDonald's, let's say, and start talking about, you know, being gaslit and targeted and harassed. I mean, I didn't do that. I didn't start talking about the evil cabal or any of that. I just did my job and left. But, no, I wasn't allowed to be submitted. Then I was... Um, nominated for best voice in a video game and then as a consequence of that because that was kind of high profile um, and that game did very well um, then I was eventually um, never got another voice acting job and I was fired and I I left that job that work like three four years ago I got fired I was punished because I was successful <laughs> Well, that's what happens, right? That is what happens. That's what you do. Yeah. If you're truly a TI and you're on the list and you're getting harassed and you're getting, well, if you get any notoriety or any, um, you got any platform to stand on to to talk about what's going on with you, then you'll be, you'll be attacked. And it's the same as you putting up the posters and the billboards. You know, they try to uh, throw a wrench in that. And, they, you know, you've noticed over the years, like, John Hall and I were going to do some um, documentaries out of L.A. They wanted to do something on targeting. Dr. John Hall put me in touch with some people. I was talking to the producer quite a bit, actually. And I, I, I kind of forewarned him. I said, look, you know, this thing could all go south from some people up above when you tell them what you want you're trying to do with the target individual documentary. Well, sure enough, his brother was uh, killed, died in a strange car accident or something. I think that might have spooked him, but you know, lo and behold, of course, all those projects out of L.A. were canceled, and then within about a month, the New York Times did a scathing article which you probably all remember on uh, targeted individuals and basically painted us all with that same black brush, brush stroke that we're, we're schizophrenic and kooks and it's all, it's all in our minds, you know, it's all in our heads. We've invented it all, you know. <clears throat> and you can just see, you, you know, you sit back and you watch how these things unfold and it's like, wow. That's why Mitch talking about Washington, D.C. and them actually being somewhat decent well that's the first I've really heard I think of people in those positions actually you know almost acknowledging that what we're saying is truthful because for the longest time all they did is just you know smash and bang you up and call you schizophrenic mm -hmm. right and, you know, some people at Targeted Justice and UL as well and, and different ones, we've, we've tried very hard to, um, you know, to drag the, not drag, but certainly point out the, the mental health industry, all the different ailments they have now, all the big form of medication that's given to people that are not schizophrenic, but they're prescribed schizophrenia medicine, 
and just, you know, big pharma is big industry. And, um, you know, mental illness is a huge industry, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so all these things have come to light thanks to people like you and me and us screaming about, hey, wait, you know, this isn't true. Um, they're, they're they're, They're using tactics on us that mimic schizophrenia, and then as soon as we speak about being followed in traffic, being having break-ins, having this, having that, being hit with directed energy weapons, having voices, any of this stuff, well, you know, obviously they just, they easy, easy peasy for them because they've designed the whole system that they can torture us and then call it mental illness. Like it's the meanest yeah. kid in grade school. It would take the... I can't even remember an evil kid in elementary school that would have been this this evil and this mean spirited. You know what I mean? I, I can't even remember a kid that was that and I knew some bullies and stuff when I played hockey and there are some, you know, scrappers and fighters and, and rough kids and stuff, but I don't remember I don't remember as a kid coming across this kind of evil. It's so heinous, and I guess I'm at the point now in my life where um, I just really, really think beyond a shadow of a doubt that, you know, we can, we know about the weaponry, we, we, we you know, we, different different people like uh, Dr. Duncan, like Duncan, and different different ones that have come forth, we know that, we know it all exists, it's not a question of whether it exists or not, we know it exists. Mm-hmm. But I, I believe that really at the end of it all, like behind, behind all of it, it, it it's this, because you see it in other areas that aren't necessarily like um, about a targeted individual. You see a general society at large right now being targeted in different ways. Um, I, you, you, you take into consideration geoengineering and nanoparticles that we do absorb. And, you know, you'll find scientists, if they aren't already suicided, that'll, that'll tell you what's, what's, what that does to, to the human, to our bodies, and how we absorb the nanoparticles and what happens when those nanoparticles then, you know, collect inside of us. I mean, we, we don't need an RFED chip anymore. We've got the nanoparticles that'll, that'll sync up or whatever. I mean, we're all, as a general population, getting so bombarded and there's so many there's just so much going on <laughs> there's just, it's, and i really think it's just plain spiritual warfare at the i guess that's my point it's kind of a long way of getting to my point but it's that basically this is a spiritual battlefield that's what we're in and after 23 years the only solace i had when i was all alone from 95 to 2002 the only solace and the only way i kept moving i used to walk on the street with my bag and i was homeless i'd lost my fancy house in the hollywood hills i'd lost my nice farm everything's gone my children were threatened stolen i'm treated like crap and yet i no one ever told me what i ever did i i'm not a criminal i hadn't stolen from anyone they'd stolen from me especially my um, intellectual property. But, you know, and then and me starting Lionsgate, that was stolen. So all the thievery and things done to me, but I wasn't the criminal. And yet I was the one that was ostracized, ridiculed, made fun of, hated, while I was continually targeted. And in those days, the only thing that got me through was a sort of, I don't know, um, I guess a real pedestrian Christianity, like just believing in, believing in this guy, Jesus, you know, <laughs> believing, believing in good versus evil. And then, you know, occasionally when my mind wasn't so messed up, because I was in total panic mode back then for most of it. And it, when I could get some quiet time and find a library or some place or a park bench or whatever, and I had a Bible, I'd read Psalms or, you know, and, it, and my gosh, or Job, you know, and it's like, wow, you know, it's the only way I could get one foot in front of the other. And I used to walk down the street with my bag just thinking, I'm just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other, you know, that's all I could do then. 
and I didn't do anything creative for two or three years. So anyone out there that feels like they're not being very productive, that they're so bombarded, especially if they're getting hit with directed energies and stuff, uh, right. don't beat yourself up on that. Like that's totally normal that, especially in beginning stages of this, that you're feeling completely um, overwhelmed um, and, and everything that goes along with it. And so if you're not doing everything that you can in terms of being a productive citizen, um, give yourself a break. And if the corner does turn and if you do find a way to turn the corner, what happened with me is then by 2004 to 2010, I created – Oh, you know, 400 paintings, had maybe 15 art shows. Um, You did three short films plus a feature film I wrote and directed. So, you know, we get that back, you know. We we can get that back, that 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 drive or that productivity that that does it, it can and it can come back. But then then it gets shut down again. So just be prepared that yeah, you might get it back. Yeah, it might be taken away again. But, you know, it's just this, man, it's, uh, Mitch knows better than any of us. It's just like scraping mm-hmm. yourself up off the pavement and then somehow finding the way to get to D.C. or finding the way to, you know, go and do a demonstration or get going again. And, you know, you just, it's, it, it we unfortunately have, but we have to allow ourselves to feel down and overwhelmed because that's pretty natural and I'm certainly not someone that's going to sit on my high horse and tell anyone oh you're feeling depressed quit feeling sorry for you I'm like you're feeling depressed that's totally normal that's that's natural try not to get buried in it so that you become catatonic but you feeling overwhelmed and sad and 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 desperate and all those feelings that's that's normal. Just know those feelings, that doesn't belong to you. That's, that's being put on you. And often it actually is actually being put on you if you want to take into consideration mood manipulation and dream manipulation and all kinds of stuff they've got now, right? I try not to use that too much in my case just because I try not to, oh, that's my excuse. They're, they're manipulating my dreams. I'm waking up every day desperate because... I'm getting attacked in in the night. It may be true, but Mm -hmm. if I accept that's my lot in life or that's what they're doing now, then I'm really not going to do much, you know? So I still have to fight the urge to just basically lie in bed all day, you know? Yes, I agree. How did you find out? Like, so you started to understand that maybe this was an organized stalking effort and black I knew right away. When I knew, I knew October 4th, 1995, when I'd taken my son to a hotel after he told me that, it, that men were hitting mummy and no police would help me, children's aid wouldn't take a report, all of a sudden friends are falling away from me. And I'm going, wait a second. And I had my son in a hotel, and that's when I was just like night and day, like followed in traffic, same license plates, I was a maniac. I had tons of energy then. I could go days without sleeping. I'm writing down license plates. Yes, those are the same plates following me all over the city. Uh, Yes, that car's outside of the hotel. Yes, my son was in the room. When I came back to the room after being gone for two minutes, there's a tall, big guy with a headset on outside my door. I go in the room, two things are located in two minutes, and my four-year-old son is threatened to be hurt or killed if he talks to his daddy, which I then put on a recorder and had him say it onto the recorder. And then I had at least 300 copies of that initial tape from October 4th, 1995, stolen out of hiding spots, safety boxes, storage uh, facilities, friends' houses, um, you name it, you know, like... That's not normal, but I knew as soon as my son was crying and a man had entered the room in two minutes when I was gone, and that guy managed to locate a phone address book I'd hid in the closet and my children's birth certificates that I'd hidden in a pile of paperwork, I knew I wasn't dealing with, this wasn't just like some angry bikers. My ex-wife was not simply just a, you know, hell's angel prostitute, um, 
This was this is a lot more complicated than that, and it involved some really you know heavy people. Plus, my partner in Lionsgate was a lawyer, John Hardy, whose father he claims and friends say it's true. Friends that we had in common anyway. Anyway, they said that his father ran Thesis, which is Canada's CIA, and that guy told me to keep my mouth shut about my kids or I was dead. And that was in April '96. So I knew from the get-go, October 4th, 1995, there have been other things prior to that, but I didn't buy into it. But when that thing happened in the hotel, I was like, wow, 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 wow. This is like the spook stuff. And I played mercenaries and stuff in, in films. And, and, you know, I... The irony is that I was an actor who had played these kind of spies or these mercenaries and stuff, and here it is in my actual life, and I'm going, wow, this stuff really does exist. Wow, you know? Hey, Stephen, this is Mitch. I just think it's amazing that you've managed to do as well as you have. Um, There was other facets to targeting, like the directed energy and the voice to skull. How did you find out about that? Did you believe it initially? Oh, good question. That's a really good question. Um, that's fabulous question, actually. Okay, so in 2002, I'm in northern Quebec. Uh, the last time I'd worked was on a show called La Femme Nikita, which is about a mind control slave. And, of course, they don't tell you that in the TV series, right? And I got treated really badly on that again. Um, and that thing that you mentioned, Luke from Counter-Strike, that was really one of my worst experiences ever, but that didn't compare with what came after 95 in terms of, you know, how I was treated. But anyway, um, 2002, I'm in Northern Quebec. I'm going to my girlfriend's, um, advertising agency and I'm going on the computer and I find mind control forms and I, and I read my story, break-ins, harassment, gang stalking. I also read, um, what's her name, something Welsh, Cheryl Welsh, Northern California, I think. Yes, Cheryl Welsh. Yes. Yeah, she's amazing. She actually went back to school. I think she got her law degree, didn't she? Yes, she did. Sorry, okay. I'm muting my phone while I'm doing things with my daughter. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so she that's did. What, that, what, why I say it's a good question is because I was reading on mind control forums about people that were complaining or talking about being hit with directed energy weapons. Right. But I'd read enough to recognize my story and all those other people's stories. Now, you know, some of those people had then progressed into getting directed energy weapon attacks. So for me, it was just sort of, rather than me feel doubtful or, okay, I'm going to throw all this person's story out the window or flush it down the toilet because they're talking about directed energy weapons or something, some crazy stuff, right? Well, no, I didn't do that because I'd already read enough of their story to go, wow, they were experiencing the same kind of harassment techniques that I was experiencing, but it's now progressed for them so that they're now getting attacked or hit with directed energy weapons. And one of those people, and she was very articulate, at least I thought she was the way she wrote, was this uh, Cheryl Welsh. So um, I kept reading and reading and researching and looking into it. And um, there was a woman out of Hamilton. I can't remember her name, but somebody else might. But she had dug up all kinds of information about um, declassified documents, on, on some of the weaponry, so the, 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 the techniques, the, the, you know, what they had, what, what had been disclosed. Um, so it just made, I mean, if they were going to do that to me and they were that cruel to me, then it really wasn't this big leap of faith to say, oh, well, then they're probably using these advanced weapons on people. And I'd met a writer, a screenwriter in Hollywood who wrote like, Ah, uh, he wrote movies for like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and stuff, and I'd worked with him, and I, I guess I considered him a friend, but in those days I didn't trust anyone, and I was living on the street, but I still had this fancy Johnny Versace jacket that I could pull out of my bag, it was wrinkle proof, and I could walk in any restaurant or bar, and it, you know, I looked good because this jacket was a really great jacket, you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, my bag is stashed around the corner. Yeah. So I went in this restaurant bar and I ran into him and he's very friendly. 
And he had connections, though, to Tommy Lee Jones and Tommy Lee Jones' cousin who ran the CIA. And that stuff really spooked me out, to say the least. And he invited to have me come and stay with him in, in uh, Santa Barbara. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I'll call you. Of course, I had no intention of calling him. <laughs> But um, this guy was, um, I asked him what he was working on. He said he was, this is about 97, 97, 90, yeah, maybe 97. Anyway, he said he was working on a screenplay about what the U.S. got up to in Panama. Now, why this is important is because the Panama War, everyone thinks it was about, um, is it Noriega and the drugs and, and that stuff, right? Well, there was a lot more going on in Panama. And this guy told me that night in the bar, and I'm stashing all this away. I don't know what to make of it, but he says, hmm, I'm writing this screenplay right now, and the CIA is so pissed off. I got Tommy's cousin calling me, and they're all trying to get me to stop, and I'm not going to stop. And I'm writing, about, I'm writing about weapons they used in the Panama War. Mm-hmm. They were experimenting with these, I um, can't remember if he called them futuristic, but it was, he alluded to something like that, you know, like that they were experimenting with these weapons in Panama, in the Panama War. So cut to, this is the reason I went on this tangent, cut to years, like five years later, when I'm on mind control forums at this ad agency at night on the computer, and I'm reading in my story, but these people are talking about getting hit with directed energy weapons. I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is a lot like Gary DeVore. And this is like what Gary DeVore was talking about in Panama. Maybe this is what he was talking about. Because what happened to Gary DeVore, he considered himself kind of a tough guy. And I think maybe back in the day he thought I was a bit of a tough guy. I'm not, but maybe he got that. Anyway, <clears throat> Gary DeVore was sort of like an old-fashioned screenwriter type guy, you know, cowboy boots, drank whiskey, you know, that kind of guy, right? Had a bit of a swagger, wrote action adventure films. Well, Gary DeVore, after I saw him in the restaurant, um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd, you know, check out newspapers at the library and read what was going on and stuff. And I think it was in L.A. Weekly, I read that um, Gary DeVore had disappeared. And his new wife had no idea where he was. Well, Gary DeVore was missing for two years. And they finally found him in his truck, in an aqueduct. And it made no sense that he could have had a car crash or driven off the road and landed in this aqueduct. Aqueduct. And then I found out, because I then became sort of friends with his wife just the last couple of years. She told me that she had been phoning the uh, police every day. And she had phoned the CIA and said, I just want a body. I want to know what happened to my husband. Surely you've found him by now. And it was the next day, according to her, that they phoned her, or the CIA phoned her and said, we found Gary's body. Well, she took it to the, we went to the, I think the L.A. coroner, or California coroner, and they, um, you know, did their thing with the body and said, yes, that's Gary, that's Gary DeVore. Well, she didn't trust them. So for anyone out there that's listening that thinks, oh, people think I'm paranoid. Listen, we're all paranoid when weird, weird stuff starts happening. That's a normal response, people. So what Gary DeVore's wife did is she sent Gary's, remains to a, to a um, what do you call it, the uh, coroners. She sent it to a coroner up here in Canada someplace. It may have been Winnipeg, but I'm not sure. But anyway, she sent all his remains to a coroner in Canada, and it was determined that it was Gary's bones. But the, what they'd done to Gary is his skeleton was sitting in the truck. Gary apparently always kept his wallet in the front pocket, but this time it was in his back pocket. But there was still money in his, in his wallet. And then what else they found when they found the body is they found his hands both been cut off and his hands were in the back seat. Well, when she sent the remains up to Canada to the coroner, the coroner said it was Gary's body, but that the hands, it seemed like the hands belonged 
to like a 200-year-old corpse of, say, an aboriginal man. Mm. So what does that do, do you think, to people that are screenwriters and very anxious to get their leg up, and they want to make it in Hollywood because I want to be rich, and I want to be famous, and I want to date beautiful women and have everybody clamoring to see me and all these all these unfortunate people that go to Hollywood with that intention. Um, I don't really think I fall into that category. Maybe I did at one point, but it was never... I really fell in love with acting, and that's why I think I became an actor. <clears throat> but in the case of all these screenwriters that want to be famous and, you know, da-da-da, well, you start hearing a story of Gary DeVore, and you start having an, uh, a literary agent tell you that, behind closed doors, listen, I know you want to write about the CIA and we're all in favor of it and the CIA will help us, but we've got to do what they say. We've got to write the sort of stories that they want us to write and they'll help us. So I mm-hmm. think in the case of Gary DeVore, him wanting to write a screenplay about Panama, the drug trade, and... Perhaps those weapons that he told me about, that he was writing about when I met him in the bar. <clears throat> well, any young screenwriter, here's that story of Gary DeVore. Uh, it sure causes them to sort of want to back off writing anything real about the CIA, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see how that works, though? Yeah. Yeah, you kill, you kill one Gary DeVore. You kill one Gary DeVore, and it saves them from killing, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 other screenwriters that want to have a big mouth and talk about things. So that's why, unfortunately, when we talk about Hollywood, and no one, no one hates Hollywood more than me these days, but when you talk about Hollywood and the weakness and the spineless people in Hollywood and the ones that won't risk anything because they want to keep their palatial mansions and their prestigious, prestigious life, you know, and their sex orgies and whatever else they get up to on the weekends. But, you know, they want to protect their position and they don't want to get off the curb. Well, some of those people are really probably living in fear and they're certainly fearful of writing about anything truthful. And it seems like any of this directed energy weapon Anything to do with targeting has really had a... I mean, look at my own... I, I'm not even allowed to do voice work, you know, even though I get nominated for best voice in a video game for the world. But I'm not allowed to do voice work. I'm not allowed to do anything. And there's no reason given. And I wasn't the one beating up my wife, and I certainly wasn't the one threatening my four-year-old son. I was just a guy who happened to be an actor, who came home one day find bruises on my ex-wife's face, on my wife at the time's face, and then my children unfortunately told me about men hitting mommy, and then it escalated into this spy game stuff. And that's, that's basically it. But they have to hate me, and they have to find reasons to hate me so that they can live with themselves. But in actuality, they really don't have that many good reasons. Because I was a pretty loyal, good friend to a lot of people. And, uh, yeah, the Gary DeVore thing, uh, his wife, I don't think, even realizes that he told me about, uh, about these, the, this uh, experimenting with these, these new weapons. I may have mentioned it to her, but she prefers to think it was because he was revealing truths about the, uh, you know, the drug trade. And that's fine. But for any of us and anyone that's ever experienced directed energy weapons, it tells you, how much the government, certainly in those days, wanted to put a lid on it. Uh, that seems to be the case. I've heard stories like that in L.A. from other people, too, who aren't Good. necessarily individuals, but people interested in writing screenplays and divulging some of the secrets. And, you know, I've also interviewed people on my radio show that talk about working with Hollywood and giving them input. And, you know, right. So it's... It's interesting. Yeah. Well, they want it, you to write, what, you know, what they 
that they're allowed to talk about. Like even the people who advise the Holly, you know, in Hollywood, they can't even talk about everything that really goes on. And, and it's, Ella, it's changed so much in the, since I've been gone. Um, almost everything now has a propaganda slant to it. Um, right. There's so many. We're, I'm on Netflix. And we hardly watch it, but yeah, you know, Kim watches Walking Dead or whatever. And I'm going through uh, the Netflix. This this is just last night, and I'm thinking about doing this uh, talk with you today. And I realize if you go to Netflix, anybody that's listening, go to Netflix, go through A to Z on all the movies they've got on Netflix, especially the Hollywood movies made in Hollywood. There's very few independent films. I know that because I wanted to get my film in Netflix. And you've got to have insider contacts, and because I'm blacklisted, there's just no hope in, in you know, hell, right? <laughs> but when you go through the movies, they're almost all about something like some degree of MKUltra in there. You know, and anyone that doesn't know about MKUltra, that's also, it's declassified, it's fact, and it wasn't just happening in the 60s and 70s or in 50s, people. <laughs> it's happening more than ever today. <laughs> and that includes ritual abuse, which they don't really do too much in, in the movies telling you about the truth behind MKUltra. They pretend they just grab adults and put them in the system, like in that TV show Nikita that I did. And right. I was outspoken about that because I said, no, the likelihood is they grab two- and three-year-olds and they start then, you know, with torture trauma so they can create altars and they can create their... You know, they're assassins, prostitutes, whatever they need, drug mules, whatever. <clears throat> but if you go through the movie lists, almost all the movies are about MK Ultra or about military, about war, about, it, it, you know, it's all propaganda. Like, almost all of it. Like, it's so hard for Kim and I just to find a sort of, kind of good old-fashioned, you know, just a, you know, there's, the only thing you can watch are these really badly made, and I watch them. Sometimes I even cry, and Kim looks at me because, you know, Kim considers me a pretty good filmmaker and writer. And the only thing I can watch a lot of the times are just like these really bad, really corny Hallmark movies, you know, where the, where the, the, the baseball, the famous ex-baseball player goes home to his little hometown, and he was the baseball star, and he... He runs into his high school sweetheart that he'd taken <laughs> off on to pursue his... That's Steven's story, by the way. <laughs> what's, what's that? That's your story. In <laughs> it is a little bit, yeah. And I watch these movies and I'm like, I tear up. because like, what's wrong with you? This is like, it's a Hallmark, one of these corny Hallmark movies. And it's like, I know, but it's corny. And it's like, it's. I think I cry because it's like, this is the way I thought America. This is the way I thought Canada was. Like, we, we all did back then. You know what I mean? Oh, look I at know. that. And she's got a little florist shop, and she still cares about the guy, and she's still hurt that he took off on her to become this baseball star. And, and he's kicking himself in the head thinking, oh, I really let a good one get away, you know? Oh, man, it's funny. Yeah, for a while, that's all I was watching, too. I felt so weirded out by all the films, and and I still do. I don't even like Netflix, and I, I just, I see your point. And anybody like Black Mirror and all these shows on Netflix are, like you said, yeah. they really are, and that's, that's propaganda. Almost all of them, like not just a few, like almost all of them. And I didn't yeah, I know until last year when I, go, I really I just, started thinking about doing out. the show with you and looking through and going, oh, is this me? Because I do, I tend to sort of, I try to be really objective with myself, you know, and I'm, am I just, am I kind of cherry picking because this suits my, my frame of reference or the way I now think? So I'm like, no, no, you know, be diligent, like go through the movies and, and, and really look and see if, you know, most of these films are really about propaganda, like war and Ultra and stuff, and it's like, oh, no, shoot, yeah, no, most of them are, wow, you know. And I thought maybe it was just because, you know how, like, these algorithms are super smart now, they have, like, little brains of their own, so they see what you're watching, you know, the, the, the same kind of algorithms they have on Facebook that keeps us, 
secluded to our group. Um, they yeah. have that on everything, you know, Google, like you're searching something on Google, and then there's an ad for it. That's just algorithms that are programmed. And so I, I thought maybe, gosh, all this stuff is so dark and twisted, and I don't want to watch any of it. I'm like, are we watching a lot of shows like that? I'm like, Kaylee, what are you watching? And she's like, Princess Diaries, and, you know, and I went through it. Yeah, and you love that. that med- so I'm like, I thought maybe it was some kind of algorithm thing, but it really is that way. I've talked to other people. I'm like, how come everything's dark and twisted? And okay, here's a good example. You know, there used to be the Archies, and see, I'm, I'm a little bit older. I'm a lot older than you, let's say, but I'm 61, so I was a teenager. I was a, I guess we were, t- what were we, teenagers in the 70s, right? Mid to late 70s, a I'm a teenager. Out. And then just prior to that, I'm like 12 years old, 10 years old. What did I love to read? The Archies. Right? I remember that, though. Those were around when I was a little kid. I was a, yeah, those, okay, there was Betty Archie, and Veronica. There was, Most uh, girls wanted to be, well, you wanted to be either Betty or Veronica. Most girls wanted to be Betty because she was the goody two-shoes. Some girls maybe wanted to be Veronica because she had a pool. I wanted to be Veronica. <laughs> You know what I mean? But, you know, and the guys, you know, they they like Jughead. You know, we, we were kind of across the board. You know, I don't think many guys wanted to be Reggie because he was kind of a dick. But, you know, <laughs> Archie or Jughead was kind of it. Not many of us wanted to be Moose, you know. But, yeah, so we all related to the Archies. And we're wholesome stuff, right? Well, they've right. got a show called Riverside on Netflix. And I, I'm I'm watching it, and I'm thinking... Wow, this is got this is really dark, and there's real MK Ultra undertones to it, and this rich girl that's not in the original comic strip in it, and the brother dies, and it's just very. If you have anybody that analyzes things, look at Riverside, and you'll see what I mean about there's a dark, foreboding feeling just sort of beneath the surface. And I thought that's weird. Well, they also the same people that did. Riverside, which is really the Archies, they also produced or reproduced, redid the the TV series called Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And I think Sabrina used to be a comic strip. It was a spinoff, I think, of the Archies back in the day. Well, you look at Sabrina now, there's pentagrams and all this. It's insanely, insanely dark satanic imagery that's the only word that i can use really you know it's in the school libraries i was volunteering in the, in the library uh, i would do library work and in the elementary school and there was that stuff i couldn't yeah. believe it you know you can I go to walmart shocked. now and you can because of sabrina the witch and i guess some other shows you can now go to walmart and it's 14 inches high i don't know where i have the memory for this stuff it's 14 inches high, and it's a statue of Baphomet. Ugh, that's creepy. And it's like Baphomet for kids. You know what I mean? I told my daughter, go, go into that store you like and go pick out a T-shirt. And she was 16 or 15. It was kind of like this cool little store in the mall. And she came out with this shirt, and I didn't look at it. And, and she came home, and she was going to work to school. I go, that's Baphomet. That's satanic. She goes, it just looked cool, Mom. She I didn't know. know. Oh, wow. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I get it. It's not her fault. It really isn't. And when you when we talk about movies, and the question is, well, like, what came first, the horse or the cart? Well, like, are movies made that that are really just about war and just about like MK Ultra, uh, female assassins, and you know, are these movies because that's what the general public wants to see? And, and I've changed my mind in that on way that. to me. Oh, it's in that Not way. all the moms I, I know. That. Those movies are being intentionally, intentionally shoved down, especially young people's, you know, and shoved into their minds. I mean, these movies are being made to condition us and condition our children especially. It's called programming for a reason. And I didn't used to think that way up until not that long ago. I thought, oh, come on, there's supply and demand. If people want to see a, a film about horses, then there'll be a film about horses, you know. But you look around and you look on Netflix, and, and the war movies all are sort of pro, you know, pro, you know, CIA. Oh, and, and then if the CIA is ever corrupt or bad in any of these movies, it's always just one rogue guy at the CIA, right? Right. 
So that's mm-hmm. like saying to Midge, yeah, she goes to Washington, D.C., they're treated pretty great, and then they do a little investigation, and then they find out, oh, it was this one guy, Jack Horner, and Jack was a bad apple, and he's the one. He's the one that was doing the directed energies, and he's the one that was... And it's like, no, no, sorry, that doesn't hold any water, because guess what? This targeting... And what's happened to so many people now around the world, this isn't one bad apple in the CIA that's allowed this to happen. This is a collective group of people, including private firms like Black Cube, which is who Weinstein hired to destroy the the women that were going to testify, come out about them. Well, he sucked Black Cube on them. So they broke in and harassed them and followed them and scared the pants off these women, right? Of course. But this is not just one bad guy at the CIA. This is, uh, I'm imagining this is probably, you know, yeah, fusion centers, but this is basically almost all, all the alphabet agencies, and not just the U.S. This is also MI6, MI5, certainly CSIS, Canada for sure, for sure, for sure. And then it's frightening that local police are also involved, so... Yeah, they can't make a movie about T.I.s. I mean, I did, but you can't make a movie about T.I.s. And at the end of the movie, it's like, oh, we'll just wrap it up in this nice little bow, and we'll give the audience that one guy, Jack Horner, who worked at the CIA. He was the bad guy. No, we're talking about evil and an evil humanity that has, like, perpetuated and developed all these technologies that are being used against us and are probably slowly being used. Because I see people around me that were on the verge of kind of coming around or waking up about whatever, vaccines, whatever. And I've noticed just in the last six months, it's like these people, and I've been around people 23 years now trying to get them to open their eyes about what was going on with me. And so I'm hypersensitive to how people react. And these people that were on the verge of kind of going, yeah, I see what you mean. They suddenly have like put on the brakes and done an about face and and marched off in the other direction. It's like I, I can only imagine, and this is just me imagining, but I can only imagine that it might be from all the food, from the geoengineering, from our vaccines, from everything put together, it's just somehow dumbed people down so that those that were on the verge of possibly waking up and realizing there's been a mad race, I think, the last couple of years to try to shut down humanity as best they can so people don't realize what's really going on. Does that make any sense? Makes perfect sense. Sorry, my phone's muted because of the background noise, but um, it does. And I was going to make a point about. Um, hold, on. Kaylee, can you hold on just a second, sweetie? I'll just go upstairs. Hold on, I'm gonna go upstairs. Um, okay, cutie. Okay, hon. So, um, anyways. Um, what was my point? Even with children these days that are being programmed to think it's okay to have no privacy. Yeah, if that makes any sense. Sure. With everything with Instagram and Facebook and all these different things. And I have them watch Snowden, and I've told them about this mass surveillance project that the CIA has been doing, or NSA, for, for decades. And it became really overt, or became on such a large scale after the Patriot Act um, was created, and I tried to explain all this, and my kids were all, and other kids too, it's not just my kids, are like, oh, well, whatever, I've got nothing to hide. And I'm like, but you don't understand. Privacy is privacy. We used to cherish that when I was younger. And yeah, I, I, I know. People I have this attitude. People. I'm not doing anything wrong. No, it was the worst thing me. that happened was like keeping Toms in your window if you were on the bottom floor. And, and so my daughter thinks that's funny. Well, that's what we used to call him. I'm having an interview. (laughs) Okay. Anyways, 
Well, I need to talk to that girl. <laughs> She's just a yapper. She's a yapper. She has input on everything. She's like, no, Mom, they're either your boyfriend, a crush, or a stalker. It's just those three things now. Oh, so, yeah, right, sure. And we used to have stalkers in the window. They'd be peeking in. And so, anyway, so my point is that this programming thing with these television shows, Kaylee, shh, and I'm conducting an interview. Okay. It's a very professional, serious interview, Haley. This is very serious. Just because I'm not upstairs doing the radio thing, it's just as serious. I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> she knows if I'm on the radio, like, I will, she's in big trouble. If, like, anyway, she's become very acclimated to me doing interviews, so... Anyways, so um, it is. It's just really, really sad um, what's going on with kids and, and what's being role modeled, the, old, the whole overt sex thing. It's like I know. more programming, all this overt sexuality. I, oh, I could go on and on and on about it. And, and the lyrical content, there's no, like, they, Kaylee, I'm serious. Um, it's just, you know, they go on to iHeartRadio, uh, which I support. You know, they give me a job and I get paid for it. So, but the thing is, there's no, uh, they, you should hear the lyrics. It's, I, I just can't even believe it. I mean, I'm oh, a gap. I I I've looked into rap music the last couple months. Oh, my goodness. And I don't, I don't want to get too off topic. But, um, but it's all part it, of, the so same, all it's all part of that everything. same evil. Yeah, and I guess exactly. that's my point. I mean, I'm thinking maybe I should just like really read the Bible and become a preacher because, honestly, I'm, I'm really, really at the point where uh, there's, there's, there's one guy I've been watching a bit, and he hasn't got hardly any views, but he, 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 um, he, was all, he was getting hit with directed energy weapons and doing everything and trying to find out about all the technology. And, well, now he's just praying like, like a warrior, you know, and he's calling on uh, Jesus and calling on G- the, the angels and, and, you know, to, to, to battle with him. And it's it's really come down to that. It's like this is like a battlefield, man. It really is. And I'm not just talking about the TI phenomena. I'm talking about so like when they legalize abortion. I don't know out there, you know, in 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 you know uh, pod podland or whatever. How many people or how many women are approve of New York State legalizing abortion, late term abortion? But I certainly don't. Because, you know, yeah, that's the late term part is really bad yeah, as well. Yeah, man. Like, Just you know, they, they, I, someone put a, a, a thing up the other day that, I can't remember what it was. I think it's turtles and some other uh, animal or mammal. Well, you're not allowed to, you know, there's a $100,000 fine or something if, if you uh, kill a, a baby in the womb of, like, a turtle or something like that. Like, there's these fines if you, you know, these it, with certain animals, if you kill their their baby there's a fine involved right but here we are legalizing late term abortion are you kidding me it's disgusting it really is i mean you know that's like sacrificing your baby to ball but it doesn't look like that and that's the thing about our society it's so well planned and and i'll always i'll never say all the people that have done this are are stupid oh no some of the greatest minds they've they've uh they've blackmailed or they've somehow coerced them to do their to do their research to do their bidding for them and some of the greatest minds in the world have developed these these weapons and this technology and these you know these different forms of targeting that that any of us are subjected to these are great minds evil but great minds you know, like nothing's done with by coincidence it's all done with a plan and it's so blanketed right now and all i can see really is I can just see, wow, this is truly evil. Like, truly, we are living in such, with such evil. And, and so when the Bible says that this is Satan's domain, that makes more and more sense, you know? It's the one thing that kind of gives me solace, because in the mornings I have a hard time getting going now. After 23 years, still no answer about who threatened my four-year-old. And being hated and despised by Jerry Jordan, Lisa Kirk, all these rinky-dink Canadian agents that I actually, with a Hollywood career, I, I actually was supporting them. I didn't need to. I didn't need them as agents. I was trying to build up their agencies. I was trying to be a good guy, and they all turned on me. 
Like, yeah. how do they go to sleep? How do they live with themselves? I have no idea. But somehow yeah. they got infected by yeah. this evil. And I'm sorry, after 23 years, if someone makes up some rumor about me, I think, I think that would have come out by now. I think, you know, charges would have been made. or You know, many of us TIs are never criminals. We've never been charged with anything. And then eventually some of us are set up for a crime, like my friend Hank. And then when you're set up, well, then, of course, they can, you know, stick you in jail with no bail, which happened to Hank. And just let you rot away in prison or try, try to do that to them. It's just unreal. But we're not criminals. And we're actually, you know, pretty high in the, you know, I think we're, in terms of, like, our intelligence, we're not, we're not the, we're, fairly, we're a fairly intelligent group of people if you did a consensus on all people that are TIs today. And some of them are quite brilliant, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's frightening to me. Um, but regardless, there has to be outrage. I mean, I'm seeing outrage against some of the things that are going on, and we just need to get people outraged about what's going on with us. It, it's just such a tough thing. And it's going to be up to us to create the movement in the public. And that's why I'm so big on how you speak to the public and, and how to warm people up to the topic, not to, you know, don't give them a bad association of us. And uh, it's tough. It really is. And then I have people email me, well, I'm going to shoot these people if they don't stop following me. And I'm like, don't do that. Do not do that. Not only is you, are you going to get in trouble, but you're making the community look bad if you were to do those things. And I get like one email or something like that once a month, and it's, it's frightening. And, um, you know, we just have to keep ourselves in check. And we have to remember that what we do affects the entire community. We have to really try to keep a level head uh, and present ourselves. Tell people that do also. feel that kind of anger, which is also natural and normal. Tell oh, them yeah, it is. a warfare prayer. You know, get Jesus right. and his angels to kick their ass. I mean, start really believing that's possible and, and start utilizing that because that's something that's tangible that you can, you can find those prayers and you can use those prayers. You can, you can weaponize your prayers almost, you know, like there's, there are prayers that will go and do battle for you if you mm -hmm. call, you know, you, but you got to make the call, right? That's right. And, it's a lot better. It's a lot. It's a lot better choice than, than wanting to go out and do some vigilante nonsense on your own. And you're right. It does affect everyone. Look at uh, Myron May and different. You know, his intentions were good, but Myron, man, as a lawyer, what were you thinking? Like, man, you know, and he got himself killed. And I guess he was just desperate. But man, you know, he was desperate, and he thought it'd be a way to bring attention to the cause. It was just the wrong. Yeah. Of attention, haunting us to this day. Exactly. I mean, I talk to people and they're like, oh, you mean like Myron May? And I'm like, no, um, not like Myron May. That's just most, um, the, yeah. most uh, target individuals are not dangerous people. Not at all. Because I do a lot of talking to people behind the scenes and just trying to get people to understand. I kind of feed them in little bits and pieces. You know, I understand. And, uh, I did that for years. I mean, I, I made my film with the intention of um, wanting people to share that with family and, and friends that doubted their story. I said, well, you know, tell them to watch my film. Don't tell them up front that, that, I, you know, that I'm a, a T.I. or that the person that made the film is a T.I. Just let them... Just let them watch the film, just like it's, an, you know, it's just another one of these films, you know. Let them watch the film, and then after they've seen the film, you know, they may say, oh, that was kind of a cool, you know, art film, you know, or whatever. That was pretty, that was pretty cool, you know. And then, then you can say, oh, yeah, and by the way, the writer-director, he's a T.I. Right. And that was kind of my plan, but... When people tell their family or friends, hey, watch this film, it's made by a T.I., they'll immediately meet uh, resistance because, because their family or, or family member or friend that doesn't believe them, they've decided that's it. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but when people make a decision, 
It's like the more you try to sway them, the more you try to convince them of something, it's like the harder they dig their heels in and the less. You're absolutely right. I've had yeah. this battle with press, with all kinds of stuff, including right. this guy was going to rewrite or do another article follow-up on us because he misquoted, misconstrued, took things out of context. And it, I understand he only had so many words, but he sure picked, he sure twisted it to make it seem like, uh, it was just a really, really bad article. Well, don't and think for a second that that guy made some mistake and it just came out like that and he didn't intend it to. For me, for me, I mean, I've been pretty lenient with a lot of things, but for me, it sounds like that was intended to be a hit job from the very beginning. It was right before the rally. Of course. That makes right perfect sense. Right before the rally. Yeah. So that's that's why he wrote the article, just like that New York Times article. Mm-hmm. It was a hit piece because we were actually making some, having some traction. Yeah, and then of we're course, down in New line. York Times comes out. We're all a bunch of kooks. They're all mentally ill. Unbelievable. The timing, pretty interesting. But, and it's amazing but my what point we is, guys have put up then with he said and that whole people, all, everybody's sending me emails and overreacting. It's part of their, it's just because they're all really mentally ill. Uh, and I, I wanted to say, you're the one who said that, and you twisted my words and made it seem like I was saying that. And I said to him, I go, you took things out of context. I said people come across that way because X, Y, Z, just, you know, because if you're sitting there saying, oh, I hear voices, just like you talked about earlier. But, you know, a lot of, they come in with an agenda. You know, they have a thought whether they're paid or not. And they come in with an agenda, and they're going to pick and choose to support their agenda. It's so simple. That's right. That's why I'm, I'm not calling them. And I didn't call anybody for the rally. I know some people are like, oh, you should have done it. And I'm like, mm, no, I don't want to speak to them. But I'll call them in the future for other people, but I'm not speaking to them. And um, it's just a nightmare. And then it's, it's harder than you think trying to get them to um, – uh, change things or, or re they won't if they take something out of context they don't have to change it they can do that you know that you're in hollywood yes. the actors you know they're like they took me out of context and they put in this word and i didn't say that word and um right. it, it's a common thing living in los angeles you hear it all the time from celebrities or people right. that are getting it yeah so, but it's just, it's a crime shame. It sure is. So I just say, you know what, we're going to make our own imprint. We're going to do all these wonderful things, have rallies, raise awareness, put our own information on there, have blogs, uh, get people you know, trying to just, you know, we're going to have our own narratives. And I always tell people, do radio, do radio, because you can have a conversation. When there's doubts, you can just say, well, this is my input. And it's not out of context. It's not twisted. It's. Usually it's like you're on air, you're live, it's an hour. They're not going to change what you do. Um, right. That's a good so point. I think yeah. radio is a good friend, and um, TV show interviews can be, but they can pick and choose again, you know, like Vice. They wanted it to be exciting and different. Even though I can sense that the person who was hosting it had empathy, you could just sense that. I really – that's just me being – really um, analytical of people's behaviors and intentions and stuff. But he really seemed genuine, but it just, they picked and choose to make it interesting so it would, so it would do well. They just wanted to be wacky. Yeah. It's more interesting that way. You know, the best one that I've seen so far, there's two. Um, there's the one from Legend Hunter um, where Matthew had a nice <clears throat> bit in there as well as some other people also said some really intelligent things as well. And <clears throat> that one, I think, did our community justice. And then there's the mind control one um, with, uh, oh, what is the guy's name, who's gone to court. Uh, he removed a chip. That one was oh, also James Walbert? James Walbert, thank you. Yeah. 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 So, um, so TV can be our friend, but, again, they can edit and pick and choose and twist and do all kinds of stuff as so many people contacted me about when they, uh, when they uh, were, when they did the Vice thing. So they'll pick oh, the, the Vice thing and make fun yeah, out of the yeah. whole interview because it needs to be interesting. It needs to, you know, drive up sales. It needs to create 
Uh, I think it's, I think it's they one of Ferguson, man. I think they, they, they really have their hands tied. Man, if I had a magazine and I wanted to do some cutting edge or some journalist that worked for me wanted to do some cutting edge story or say, hey, what about these TIs? I, I would, uh, you know, let's say the journalist approaches me and the journalist hasn't got ill intentions. And it's a really great story. I mean, just imagine, there's thousands of people around the world that are being, it's war crimes. Someone said that. I think it was Ramallah recently. It's like, these are war crimes. So there's thousands of people around the world being subjected to, and some of them have been subjected to this for over 20 years, war crimes. We're talking about war crimes. Like, that's an interesting story. So I wouldn't go in there if I was the objective journalist who was just a caring guy. I'd go in there with an open mind and go, wow, and there's all this documentation and declassified papers and these people, this guy's a doctor, this one's a, a psychiatrist, and this, you know, like, wow, these are incredible people. Uh, many of them are well-educated. They have families still, some of them, them, and they're not all yeah, dragging a scary. fucking it's cart a around with them. You. Like, these are credible people. They have no history of mental illness. Like, you know, I'd write a real, hey, what if this is really going on? And if it is, this is very, That's very That's what I serious. thought I was going to get. I was convinced, and it was very arrogant of me to think this, that I could get someone to write a positive article and end up, <laughs> maybe it is true. I thought that. It was so arrogant of me. And then I was like, oh, what? I was just mortified and um but we do shoot ourselves in the foot when we attack everybody who is considering looking into it or whatever and we attack people that we think are involved like i know I, oh it's so oh. awful because it's like people um, i know our ci community like, is who, really fractured and there are some spies and there are goofs inside our community but there's a lot of people that aren't and there are some people that think they're ti's and they're probably not but there are a lot of real, genuine TIs in our community. And when we have all our infighting, I mean, it's, I kind of understand it because everybody's, especially when you're new to it, you're really on edge. I was paranoid for years in the beginning, and rightfully so. So, I mean, I think on three occasions I saved myself from being killed. So <laughs> when you've got the son of the head of Canada's CIA telling you to keep your mouth shut about your kids or your dad, I mean, that's not just an idle threat. I mean, that's kind of hardcore, right? And he's your partner right. in lion. Right. Like, yeah, that's kind of serious. So I was right to be paranoid, but I was still paranoid. But I think that people, when they're just beginning stages especially, or maybe after, I don't know, like it might last 10 years, but they're so distrustful. And I understand yeah, them being distrusted. Years. That thing and is now, when they like, turn it against. Even if someone in the TI all. community is a perp, let's say, it's like if they're not affecting me in a direct way, what do I care? I, I, you know, I'm, like we're going to get that. That's a, that's a given. You're going to have perps inside the TI community. That's going to happen. You don't have to, like, open the door and, and lay the carpet down for them to come in and steal everything from you. But it's a given, unfortunately, that, yeah, we're going to have some of that activity. But if we focus on that. I think for the ones causing all the dissension and starting <laughs> gossip and this, that, and the other, what a great idea to keep from movement. Let's just start a bunch of nonsense. Just <laughs> That's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. splinter the group, splinter the groups. It's, I see it's the through it. When there's some random the person, well, this person said this, 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 this. I'm like, do you know this person? No. Where did you meet them? Facebook. I'm like, well, you don't know them, and you're going to trust them over right. people I had conversations with? You know, yeah. it's just weird. People are like, I take all these hotline calls, and I was like, aren't you afraid of taking these hotline calls? I'm like, I've been doing it for years. Before I even had an official hotline, I've been taking calls for years, and they're on the phone. They're not going to hurt me. And I, you know, so what? They're spying on me? Okay, well, all they got to do is go to YouTube and listen to my calls. And I, I mean, I just don't worry about that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't. Well, you're good. Just, you're good that well, way. I mean, you're, that's the way you are, right? And then other people right. are, are, are the other way. I mean, but if they can kind of, if we can, 
it's really tough. But if we could curtail the sort of infighting inside, it would be great. But on some, I guess in in, in one way, I'm, I'm I'm denouncing it, saying it's not healthy at all for the community, which it is not. And yet at the same time, I understand Why where it care. comes from and how it, you know. Manifest. Yeah, yeah, you know, and we're always looking for reasons or answers, and you know, many of us have never figured out why we even became targeted. Exactly. Everyone's searching and searching and speculating and guessing and trying to come up with ideas, and we, I mean, we can't even find. There's not even a lot of evidence in each individual circumstance. In some cases, there are. It's just so tricky. I remember I sent like um, I sent pictures to a journalist, and he goes, well, what's that supposed to mean? I'm like, those are burns, RF burns. And they're like, I don't know that. And I was like, <laughs> I mean, it's just crazy. But it's clearly nothing else. I mean, there's just, they, I don't know. They could at least say, hmm, that, is, that does make me wonder. That is bizarre. So, um, it's no, just, they won't do that. No. And, and if you want a reference... I don't know how you feel. I, I just I'm opposed to young babies getting what is it, 71 vaccines, like right off the hop, at six months yeah. old or something. I, I don't think that's good for any baby. Any. Well, now they're doing this propaganda. Oh, there's measles outbreaks everywhere, and this is right. you've got to get all your kids need to get vaccinated. And I actually was not. I was an anti-vaxxer when I was younger. Because wow, good for you. Uh, because, you know, I was just talking to too many parents and the people were concerned. Like, there, there's no autism in their family, and then all of a sudden their child. And this was becoming right. very common. And then they wouldn't even let my kids go to school. So I went to the cool, Portland's very progressive and very cool. And um, so the doctor was like, I'm just going to give her a tiny bit, and I'm going to throw the rest away. So she goes, they don't need all that extra, you know, because it was like the same dose for everybody. And um, so, yeah, I was... She she made me feel better. She cared too. She you know there's just really great doctors here. I, I wish they were in every state, but just progress. Most do, a lot of the doctors here have holistic uh, uh, degrees yeah. as well as MD, so they're both. Yeah, I've been to and, Portland. Portland's a pretty green place. I mean, it's there's some pretty cool people living in Portland. I know that. Yeah. yeah but the a, reason I mentioned the vaccine uh, issue is just because. I mean, the way that, that people that are anti-vaccine, wow, the, 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 the attack on them these days is amazing. Like, it's just, I know. It's wow, just, look at never that. understood how media puts a spin on everything. Uh, it's never more evident. I knew that from working in, you know, being in New York and working in advertising and being part of a publishing company, all these different things. I understood spin through advertisement. I didn't realize that it was so prevalent in mainstream news, and I see it everywhere. I see through everything now because we're awake. Mm-hmm. People in this community, we're, people, any of the people that are awake, like, whether, like you said, whether they're anti-vaxxers or um, chemtrails people, whatever, they're awake and they're looking and they're paying closer attention uh, and we're looking for pattern. We're looking at the deeper underlying messages. Beautiful. That's right. Yeah, well, that's what I was trying to say earlier. I couldn't articulate it very well. But like when we're so buried in our own TI surviving uh, mode stuff, when we're so concerned, and it's normal, and I'm not faulting anyone, but it's we generally come across, and I certainly used to come across this way, as um, uh, you know, just completely like. Uh, self-centered, um, you know, um, just constantly talking about this stuff. Just, do you know what I mean? So we have a tendency to come across like that based on how we've been tweaked along the way and what's been done to us. We come across as being self-obsessed. That's what I'm looking for. But when I, when I tell people, look, this is happening globally to everybody. There's an evil blanket over the world right now. It's not just TIs. It's everywhere. I only mention it because... And it helps me. It helps me to understand what kind of spiritual battle I'm in. Because if I'm only concerned, oh, man, I lost my houses, my career, my, my children, most important. Like, oh, man, I've lost everything and I'm still losing. Well, if I can get outside of my own wolf and wolfulness, my own problems, my own 
self-obsession and look at the larger picture and go, wow, look at the world, though, man. Like, look at what's going on. And if you can trace it back to the wars, that first, second world war, like most of these wars weren't even, you know, they weren't even necessary. We weren't, like, my God, the way war has been sold for, for, for centuries to people, you know, and it's unnatural to go out and kill other people and to do it in the name of God. Like, I that, know, it's brainwashing. That's just not it's right. Brainwashing. And, you know, like, yeah. some guy's abusing a girl outside of a nightclub and you, you try to stop him and you get in a fight in the parking lot. That's one thing. But, I mean, you're going off to kill a bunch. You're enlisted to go kill people you've never met. And as Muhammad Ali so eloquently once put it, these people never did anything to me or my family. You know, that was his thing about not going to the Vietnam War, right? And he was right. right. He had to go to jail and stuff, but he refused to go and fight in Vietnam. And he said, well, why am I going to go kill people who haven't done anything to me or my family? Right. You know? So you enlist and you're, you go and you say prayers and you go off into battle and you're, you know, none of us really want to kill anyone. We're not, we're not made that way. Now, if, you know, if America, someone's threatening right? your family, it's different. But, you know, I mean, we're just not made that way to go and want to kill people. But war has been sold for, 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 you know, centuries, right? That's right. a bunch of BS, man. My gosh. You know, and uh, I don't know, it's just endless. But when you look at the bigger picture, wow, maybe this is Satan's domain. Like, maybe we really are living in an evil place, and this is somehow some test that we're on. And some, and, and as a TI, I, it, it's not very popular to look, look at it this way, but some TIs do. And, and, it, and it, it does make you feel good sometimes that, you know, well, we're sort of like, you know, we're selected for this for a reason. We must be a threat on some level or something or, you know, like, wow. They don't go after the criminals, do they? No, they come after, like, you, me. People that aren't, aren't naturally criminals, they haven't done anything. They're not thieves. Right. They don't have malicious intent in their heart. And they get targeted. Well, it's got to be a spiritual realm that would do this to to innocent people. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Yeah. But, you know, the bike gang that sells drugs and gets 13-year-old girls, gets them addicted to drugs so they can prostitute them out. Well, that bike gang, the police know where their clubhouse is. Everybody knows what they're doing. Oh, but they just can't seem to catch them at anything. When we've lived through sort of, we've lived through supernatural surveillance in our own lives, and you look at that and you go, wait a second, if they did this to me, they could easily know exactly what they're doing in that clubhouse or whatever they do. You know? Right. Right. But they're serving them. That bike gang on some level is doing the dirty work for the evil that controls the planet. It's got to be that. It's just it's the only thing that makes sense. I didn't realize how evil the world was, but I guess it is. Like, wow. So, you know, we're in a spiritual battle. That's pretty much it, I guess. Right? We're in a spiritual battle, but, you know, we have to fight. I mean, even though this world's just gone crazy, we just have to fight for what's right. Because at some point, there's got to be a turning point. This world just can't go on like this. And I think it's up to us as individuals to to defend it. I mean, there's just more of us than there is of them, the controlling forces, the criminals, that mindset. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. So we just have to, every day, you know, get up and and do this thing and try to contribute in some small level. And I get a lot of joy, even though there's days I'm like, I am walking away from this thing. There are horrible people, not just out there. Because there's some, you know, I have to remember, like, even in our own community, there's some people that uh, make you want to walk away. But I have to remember what they're going through. And, you know, we have, it's all across the board. We have some of the most brilliant people. We have some people who are just, barely able to function, and then we have super 
spiritual, enlightened, lovely people, and then we have angry, bitter, ugly people. Right. And maybe they weren't always that way. We just have to remember we have to have some we have to have compassion for one another because everyone's so angry and there's all this misplaced, displaced anger that's being projected on everyone around you. And that just, you know, and like you said, you get super self-obsessed. Like, oh, I'm watching Because it is. It, 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 all the attention gets brought to you because you're living in a skewed reality. Right. So you're just thinking about you. You're like, oh, my God, is that bad? Is this Yeah, I, I don't think I was this self-obsessed even when I was a movie actor normal guy. Normal reaction when in your world, when the carpet's been pulled under Neat your feet, and you're trying to want, and you're trying to figure out what's going on. But at some point, you're not going to feel good if you keep doing that. You have to find some balance somehow in your life. Well, and that's I definitely the trick. don't force it on, like people that love me, my family, things like that. But they came around. But um, I don't force this down people's throats that don't want to hear it. Because like you said, there's that repel. It's the law of polarity. So if you keep pushing, 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 they're going to repel. That's just that's a nature, a natural law. And it's, a psych, it's something in psychology, too. You just, it, like you said, it makes them, um, when you said earlier, you try to give them more and more and more information, and it makes them, would you say, like, uh, just stand their ground even more. They dig their more heels in, yeah. They just dig their heels yeah. in. They're, they, they, they're now more determined than ever to not listen to you, to not acknowledge anything you're talking about, and they've, just, they, they've now are firmly, firmly, uh, committed to to uh, seeing you as a as a nutcase with a crazy story. Right. Yeah, you can't win. You can't you can't win. But they can go That's see a movie yeah. about a TI, and they don't realize the person in the movie is a TI. But this person getting harassed and followed and. I mean, that's in a lot of movies, including Eyes Wide Shut. That's what happens to Tom Cruise. I know, everybody he, says that. Like, once you're in this world, like, oh, I see it there. I see it in the film. I see it. Right. It's interesting that you start to see it because you've, you've experienced it. I think my, yeah. my story does overlap into the Tom Cruise-y weirdness because of who my ex-wife was and what, what yeah, she was and what her family was and all that stuff. So, yeah. You know, that's kind of where I, yeah, I, mine was spooky like that. But when you watch Eyes Wide Shut, what happened to Tom Cruise, it's actually not really all that spooky compared to what I lived through. Like, he just got, right, and, you know, and got, you know, told to back off. Like, that was it, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, comparatively, like, mm-hmm. my stuff was way worse, the reality of my stuff, compared to that. But anyone watching that film, ooh, that's really spooky what's happened to Tom Cruise's character. Ooh, you know? <laughs> anyway, my phone's going to die. My beeping thing's going. Oh, no. Okay, yeah, well, I'm let's sorry. Talk your it's art. Let's speaking. talk about your art before you go, because I know you're going to talk about maybe doing some prints that are for sale. Um, he has art that is very meaningful uh, to just to truthers, to target individuals, to anybody. And so we would like to post some of that on the website. And I know you're trying to do prints. I know you're an acclaimed artist, and I know that your work is, can be pricey, but you said you are going to try and do some prints or something that's a little Yeah, these limited there. edition prints are, are about 36 inches by 17 or 20 inches. 40 by 17. 40 by 17, something around that. Anyway, the, everyone's different depending on what size the newspaper piece is because some of them vary. But I'm doing a limited edition run of 50, and they're, they're, they're really reasonable. Even my framer says, wow, that's really good. I'm selling them for $100 U.S. Bigger. Yeah, but that's the same price. But anyway, I'm going to do um, limited edition of, of some that whichever ones people respond to, I'll go down, scan them, and then I'll go to the art printer and have them printed out, and then people can order them, if that makes sense. Uh-oh. We lost him. He wasn't Uh-oh. kidding. I, am I here? Oh, no, you're there. Where, do you have a website where people can go to purchase it? No, I don't. I've got a website where people can see some of them, but at these new ones, I was just fooling around. I sent you some email, an email today of just some that I had here, and then I, I wrote some stuff on them just today. But I'm going to keep working on some for the TI community, and if someone doesn't want to buy something necessarily it's about the TI stuff, I've got those available, too, at my, at my website. And the website, I think I've given it to you before. It's uh, stephenschellenberger.com. Will you spell that for people? 
Yeah, S T E P H E N S H E L L E N B E R G R dot com. Okay. Well, thank <laughs> like you, if I, let's Stephen. say I do one newspaper piece that people go, Oh, that really speaks to me and that speaks to me about my T I situation and everything then I'll go and I'll make a scan and I'll make posters of it. I mean, not posters. That's the wrong word. The, the graph? The prints, yeah. The yeah. limited edition signed and numbered prints. Let them know the scans are expensive. Yeah, the scans are expensive. But then once you get them scanned, it's, it's not that much to have each one made. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That, that well, makes thanks, sense, doesn't it? It does make sense. Um, so I want I want you to have support, and I know that it's important. We have to support each other. I know we're all working on limited funds, but it's kind of like what, when you give, you end up getting to, like down the road maybe you need money and you've given so people, um, they know a giving spirit and they want to help. So I, I know, hope and, that I, and you know what? Inside the TI community, I really don't sell very, very often. Some people, obviously TIs, have seen my film. But there's a lot of TIs that I've given my film to as well that didn't have access to PayPal, that some of them didn't even have access to a computer other than at the library or whatever. So, yeah, I, I've tried to be, you know, as gracious as I can be as far as, uh, you know, um, being – I know the TI, the TI community is not we're, – we're certainly not rolling in dough, that's for sure. So if, if, if a print is popular, what I could – can I can I can adjust the price also so it's more affordable for everybody. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Stephen. I don't want to keep you, so I know your phone's about to die. But again, I didn't get to get any answer so any much. questions, did I? What? I didn't get to answer any questions. Do you want to? Is your phone? You still got a little bit of time? Uh, I think I'll run out. Yeah, I think my phone's done. Okay. Does anybody well, thank have you. a really pressing? A uh, question that they just have to absolutely ask me, and I'll answer them. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Star six. I'd like to ask a question. Oh, there's already a bunch. Okay, uh-huh. Anyway, if my phone dies, it dies. Okay, that's just the way it is. So I'll try to do what I can. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Go. It's going to mute you for one second. I'll unmute you. Okay. Okay. not letting me go to her. I'm trying to go to Luda, but I'm not understanding. Hold on. Oh, I'm in the wrong place. Okay, let's see. Did you get my last email that I sent you of those images? I haven't checked it in a few okay. hours. Okay, okay, good. So I'll send you another email just to make sure you got them and stuff. Okay, hold on one second. Let's go to Midge. Let's go to Midge. Okay. Hi, oh, Hi, guys. I just want to say something real quick. Stephen, I just want to thank you for being such a good friend Aww. and a friend to the community because, you know, we get our courage from the courage of others. And right. you certainly have done that for me because um, when I was hurt so badly that one time, you happened to call me, just happened to call me, and you just let me cry and uh, you comforted me, and I just can't thank you enough. Oh, Mitch, we... <laughs> We care so much about you here. We really do. We don't talk a lot, but no, honestly, we we love you, mm-hmm. Mitch. And, and what's mm-hmm. what's happened to you and what you've endured. And, and I don't say you're a victim. I always say you're a survivor. And it's like, wow, what you've gone through. And you still get up and do stuff. And you still get to Washington. And you'll like, you're, it's really it's it's a real testament to who you are. Well, you too. I mean. When I first met you, taught me so much, and so thank you for your oh, all that you have done. Okay. 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 Talk soon. All right. Thanks, Mitch. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay. Let's go to Melinda, your friend Melinda. Oh boy. <laughs> Hi, Melinda. Hi, kids. Listen, I'm so glad you spoke, Stephen. You sound wonderful, and. Um, I'm going to contact you about your Prince I'd Love one, actually. Um, okay. It's great to hear your voice, and I love your energy, and I always feel so much better. It's been kind of a rough day. Uh, I always feel so much better 
when you talk and when you're, the Spirit of God comes out of you, you uh, have a, a great effect on people. And I hope you, you touch base more often in the calls and, and just say hello and thank you, sweetheart. Well, thank you. And you helped me a lot the other day, reminding me to be grateful. I, I, I was pissed off and wasn't in the mood for it or anything. But just so you know, I got thinking about it after. And I'm like, you know what? Mm, damn it. Melinda's right. <laughs> one of those things, you know? Yeah, because I, 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 one of the greatest regrets in my life is that I didn't thank my parents for all what they did to, for me and everything. And I, I really, really regret that. And I just say I just don't want to miss anything that I can be grateful for now, you know, now yeah. that I have the wisdom to do it. And you're right. And with the T.I. life, it's like, uh, there's nothing to be grateful for. But maybe if it's on the spiritual end, wow, and God's yeah. allowing this to happen to me, wow. Maybe someone up there really cares about me and my spirit and where I'm going and all those other things, right? And here I am breathing, and it's morning. Yay, another day, you know? Yeah, all right. All right, we'll talk soon. Okay, cool. Okay, honey, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to hear your voice, Melinda. I'm going to go to Mark. Hi, Mark. Yeah, uh... <clears throat> I was just trying to, uh, Stephen. What yeah. is your last yeah. name? What is your last name? Well, I got two last names, but my original last name is the name I used. When I was an actor, and that's Stephen Shellen. S H E L L E N. And you were in a movie Gone in sixty seconds. Oh, yeah, but that was at the tail end of my career. I was already homeless by that point. And and another, A River Runs Through It with Robert yeah, Redford. That's right. And uh, what was the name of your T.I. movie? Uh, the movie I wrote and directed? Uh, yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay. Well, it's called The Spark, and it's on Vimeo. And if you go to my website which I just mentioned earlier, stephenschellenberger.com. If you go to my website, there's a clip of my film. It's a minute, dramatic, psychological thriller, art film, kind of. Um, but if you go to my website, you'll see it on the homepage, a link for my, um, for my film. And you can watch the trailer as well and see if it's something that interests you. It's about a guy who, yeah, he realizes he's a TI, but he doesn't know that. And he also starts getting uh, directed energy hits and, and even voice to skull, which I never had, but I put it in the movie for the character. Okay. And uh, what is the uh, address or uh, where I can see the spark? Uh, just go to my website and you'll get a link. So it's on uh, Vimeo, but if you go to my website, stephenschellenberger.com, because when I was targeted, I invented Schellen as an as a as an artist so i changed it up just a little bit from my name shellen i added b-e-r-g-e-r -E so as right, an artist right. and a film director i use shellenberger okay so well that helps that, i want to show the spark to several people great idea yes great idea and try not to tell them it's made by a ti before they watch it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll break it to them after they see it. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to go. Yeah. Got it, man. That's great. That would be fabulous. I'm anxious to hear. All right. Okay. Hey, God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you, Mark. Okay, so I'm with two five three. Are you there? Yep. Hi. Hello. Well, I'm looking. I was just seeing if 253 was unmuted, but maybe they walked away. So I'm going to go to the hello, next part. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, hello. hi. Hi, it's James Lico. Oh, hey, James. Hi, James. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. Nice to, nice to talk to you again. Yeah. Um, I really like that movie, uh, a, a River Runs Through It. Which part did you play? I was like the sixth or seventh lead. Uh, I, I'm the, the loser from L.A. 
that picks up a prostitute. Boy, is that ironic. And I get my ass sunburned when I go fly fishing with oh, what yeah, I remember that scene. Yeah, good. Oh, uh, yeah, that was a great movie. And uh, I don't think I've seen the other one where, where your T or the, where their covers TIs. Yeah, that's a movie anyway. I wrote and directed. But because I'm blacklisted from the entertainment business, um, I released it on my own. Um, I was hoping to get into Netflix, but I realized that was pretty political. And given my name and, and who I, and what, what has happened as a TI, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to put this out on my own. So if you go to stephenschellenberger.com, my website, yeah. you'll see the clip from my film and a link for my film on my website. Yeah, I got that, Stephen. That's great. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. Okay, um, perfect. I Let did, me know what you think. All right. Uh, I did want to mention that. Underneath the, the film, or just there's an email address on my website. Write me anything you want. Let me know what you think. Okay. I think and you'll I, enjoy I, it, though. What? I think you'll enjoy it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sure I will. Fabulous. Uh, great. All right. There's one more thing that I wanted to bring up. You mentioned uh, how, you know, it seems like. They're killing us, and uh, what the, what they but uh, what they really want is to use us for human experimentation because they don't have any respect for life. That's and, very true. Uh, That's one of them. Well, I think there's a number of reasons they do it. I also think they're probably collecting our DNA for their AI and their future transhumanist agenda. So, but yeah, you're right. We're, yeah, correct. Yeah. They're doing all we're, kinds we're, of things. There's there's always. Dozens right. of reasons why they do things. They don't That's ever. Do right. I, I explained that to Kim years ago, and she didn't know what I meant, but now she does. Like invading Iraq, it was about oil. It was about this. It was about that. It was about five or ten different things. And it was about human right. experimentation and testing those weapons. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, uh, and then, then they could use them on us because they already tested them and they know what they can do. And that's and what that's my friend Gary DeVore. And they made a documentary about him. It's called The Writer with No Hands. And he's the guy that went disappeared for two years, and then they found him in a truck with his hands cut off. And oh, Gary DeVore was, he had told me he was writing, and what, he's come, what he came across were the advanced weapons that they were experimenting on in Panama. And okay. that was when he said that Tommy Lee Jones' his cousin and the CIA was telling him, you cannot do this film. You cannot finish. Don't. You're not going to make this screen. You're not going to finish the screenplay. And, you're going to die. and he didn't listen to them, and he ended up dead. All right. Well, I was thinking, you know, if we had something to anchor this thing, so somebody could get some kind of truth, and then you, and then that would be an anchor that could draw them to check on that. And when they're checking on that, they could check on the other thing because so often I think we give them these handouts and they just forget them because they don't really believe it in the first place but if they had to go on the computer to check one thing out they could check the other thing out That's i don't know it's, yeah. maybe, it's, maybe it's maybe it's worth something maybe it's not okay here's right. the thing okay here's the thing oregon senate committee passes bill to allow starving mentally ill patients to death what how's that wow yeah, and then here's one. Hitler authorizes killing of the disabled. They kind of yeah. coincide. So what you've got is the beginning of the of uh, 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 of the Nazi. Oh, I, oh I, I'm no. conv- I know that for certain. Going back to Operation Paperclip, the Nazis never went away. We no, were they went to Argentina. Of all that they, had stuff. Huge, they had a huge compound in Argentina. They were all set up. They, it was like they just went from Germany to Argentina and just took up where they left off, and they, they went on you know, developing things. Well, the whole space program was run by Nazis. Nazis. I mean, mean, yeah, this is, we're just one big experimentation. But it wasn't just the Nazis. They were doing eugenics at Yale and different East Coast uh, universities at the turn of the century. So, you know, they, the Dr. Evil and his gang – whether it's German, or American, British, whatever, they've been on this for quite a, quite a while. And we really are. We are, yeah. We're the guinea pigs. Right. 
Yeah. So the date of this, I think, is it's late. It's I think that either it has the governor's signature of Oregon or it's waiting for it. But it passed both houses of their Congress, Senate and House. So I mean that's that's pretty bad. Uh, you know, these people. What happens is they lose the the respect for life. And what they're doing now is showing their true colors. And um, so I think what they propose to do is starve the ones who are, like, out of it, you know, the mentally ill, the the uh, disabled, the Alzheimer's patients, um, you know, dementia, starve them to death. And, and that's a law, or that will be a law. I... I I don't know if it's a law or if it will be a law, but it only requires the governor's signature. And I think, you know, anybody that looks this up will find it. Wow. That both houses of Congress passed it. Wow. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I'd like to have something. Maybe other people could do this too. I think it just, if it's me, it's not going to work as well. I think if other people push it the same and come up with their own ideas to compare and contrast, uh, you know, Hitler and well, they also, they took away the guns in Germany when Hitler came to power. They took right. away the guns. That's another thing that happens. People lose their guns. Well, like they, 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 they try to take Really, it's all very systematic, the way they do it. And, and we're exactly yeah. at that stage right now. And then uh, you heard my outrage about late-term abortion. I mean, right. no one even, like, thing. how, how, how yeah. big an outrage was? There wasn't much over that. There wasn't any. Why were people marching you know, in the people, streets? People I, are like uh, anesthetized. They're I they're mindless. And that's what and, brings uh, me to, to to question whether everybody, Joe regulars out there, when we're when we don't understand why everyone seems to be so so ice cold and so lacking in empathy. Well, maybe maybe the general population has reached such a catatonic state through what they've absorbed or, or eaten or been given, that they just don't, they don't have the capacity to care anymore. Because the late-term abortion thing, I, I had girlfriends that had my abortion. I, I, now I feel so disgusted and terrible about it. But, you know, we all thought, well, the government said it was legal, so it must be okay. And that was my thing. Yeah, that's right. And it's like the Stanley Milgram experiment. Stanley Milgram experiment. Which one's that? What happened? Sixty-two percent will go ahead, and if somebody in a white coat says it, it must be true. So these oh, yeah. people, okay. you know, they say, "Oh, you know, you can use these people as experiment victims, right?" And uh, you know, you can do anything you want to them because we say so, right? Yeah, it's really yeah the human condition, but it gets really frightening. That's why you gotta. I don't know if you believe, you know, in God, but man, uh, it's. It certainly saved me in more ways than one, just because I'm so dissatisfied, is putting it mildly, but I'm so dissatisfied with the human condition. But well, I I'm a new think believer. that there's been some relation also, and people don't even, it's like they just, they've lost their empathy or something. They have. You know, and, and what doesn't really help is that over the uh, Umqua and... Um, Oh, the valleys here in Oregon, they've been spraying lithium. And uh, yeah. and I believe they're doing it all over the country. And yeah. this numbs your, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a psychoactive chemical. That's right. That's right. Lithium barium. Well, guys, yeah, I have I know. to call it a night. Um, it's 8.05, and it's just getting a little busy here. So okay. I just want to say, Stephen, thank you so much for coming back on. Thanks and my for being my lost it. Isn't that sir. something? Yeah, we love you, and let's get some of those prints. Um, you know, let's let's get let's support Stephen and purchase some of those prints, and um, let's help each other out. We're uh, I hope we can be a more of a tight knit community. I've known Stephen for a few years now, and he's always sweet, always wonderful, and you're very consistent that way. So thank you. Ah, thanks so much, Ella. I'm glad I came on. I'll send you an email. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you Stephen. Guys. Thank you, Ella. Okay, bye, James. James. Take care. See you guys on Thursday.